world news tonight. Public trial. Pakistan's ex-Prime Minister Imran Khan ordered to appear before court in his first public appearance since imprisonment. Fire alert. Bushfires ravage parts of Western Australia as authorities issue emergency notices. Border blast. Terrorism ruled out in deadly vehicle explosion near US Canada border. Macy's Day. Building-sized balloons spring to life ahead of Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in USA. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and you're joining us on World News. Tonight's top story starts in neighbouring Pakistan. A court in Pakistan had asked the authorities to prison jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan before it next week for a public trial in a case related to alleged leaking of state secrets. The special court established under the Official Secrets Act in capital Islamabad said that Khan and former Foreign Minister Sahan Mehmood Qureshi, who is also in jail, should be produced in court on the 28th of November. It will be Khan's first public appearance since he was imprisoned in August in another case related to the illegal selling of state gifts he received from foreign leaders and governments during his tenure as Prime Minister from 2018 to 2022. Khan was removed as Prime Minister after he lost a no-confidence vote in Parliament in April 2022, a move he blamed on a conspiracy hatched by the United States in collusion with his political opponents and the powerful military. Khan's legal troubles mount as Pakistan heads towards a crucial general election in which his PTI party is expected to make huge gains, even though the PTI chief's conviction bars him from contesting. A speeding car crashed and exploded in a deadly fireball on a US-Canada border bridge, triggering a major security scare of the eve of Thanksgiving. Two people in the vehicle died and a U.S. border agent was injured, but New York's governor ruled out terrorism. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. U.S. authorities say there is no evidence a deadly car crash on Wednesday at a Niagara Falls U.S.-Canadian border crossing was an act of terror. Details surrounding the Rainbow Bridge crash remain murky hours later, however, leaving it to be determined whether it was intentional or accidental. Here's New York Governor that. Kathy Hochul. At this time, there is no indication of a terrorist-involved attack here at the Rainbow Bridge in Western New York. We've identified that this is a local individual, a Western New Yorker. Two individuals died in the, in the vehicle. This security footage of the crash shows the car traveling from the U.S. side at high speed, then hitting an object and flying into the air over an eight-foot fence before crashing to the ground in flames. Ricky Wilson witnessed the incident firsthand. I closed the door to my car, and about 30 feet from me, I seen something airborne. I first thought it was an airplane. It looked like slow motion. And I said, my God, it's a car, and it, it's a vehicle, and it's flying through the air. He hit the concrete barrier probably uh, right at the signal, God knows how many thousands of feet before the bridge. It went airborne, and we all heard, the people in the building heard it, the, uh, metal on metal. Then all of a sudden I saw black smoke and then fire. There was no explosion. The driver was a 56-year-old man who was traveling in a Bentley automobile with his wife to attend a concert by the rock group KISS in Toronto. The crash comes amid heightened security concerns stemming from the conflict in the Middle East and at the peak of U.S. holiday travel on the eve of Thanksgiving. Hochul said Rainbow Bridge will remain closed as authorities conduct their investigation and that other Niagara crossings will remain open but on, quote, heightened alert status. Now, Australia is being challenged by raging bushfires across the western part of the country. We've also learned that fires ravaging Perth's northern suburbs are expected to continue for several days. To report more on the latest developments, we have other special correspondent Adshaya Vasakan joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Yes, Sanui. At least 10 homes and four structures have been lost 
while more than 500 people are without electricity and up to 100 transmission lines have also been impacted due to the fire across the city of Vanaroo and Swan in Western Australia. The Department of Fire and Emergency Service has issued an emergency warning for residents in parts of Banksia Grove, Jandabup, Marijanup, Malaluka, Sinagra, Tapping and Vanaroo as well. Moreover, the residents in these areas are advised to stay up to date with the latest emergency warnings and advice on the Emergency Western Australia website. The fire has burned through about 1,500 hectares of land as of right now, with trees and land in the affected areas still smouldering. Plans are in the works for Premier Roger Cook to visit the fire as soon as possible. Currently, the state of Western Australia is experiencing a severe heat wave affecting the state's central west, lower west and southwest areas, including the Perth metropolitan area. Thank you very much. That was Adhaderna World Special News correspondent Adzia Vasakan from Melbourne, Australia. Over in Gaza, amid conflicting reports over the timeline regarding the ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas, hostages could be released as early as this Friday. The deal also includes more aid into Gaza. Israel says the terms of the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas through mediation by the United States, Egypt and Qatar will not go into effect before Friday. That's according to Israel's national security advisor, and despite an earlier announcement by Hamas that the ceasefire deal would begin on Thursday at 10 a.m. local time. A report citing an Israeli source said the delay is because Hamas and Qatar had yet to sign the agreement. However, the source said they were confident the agreement would go ahead. I welcome the news that 50 hostages, all women and children, will be released in return for the release of 150 Palestinian women and children and a much-needed humanitarian pause. I thank the governments of Egypt, Qatar and the United States for facilitating this agreement. Under the terms of the agreement, Israeli officials said the hostages would be released in four phases during pauses in the fighting, with at least 10 hostages released at each stage. Officials also said the pauses would allow for an increase in humanitarian aid to Gaza, although there is no agreement on how much aid would be allowed into the enclave. Israeli officials have also confirmed that the country's air force would stop flying over southern Gaza and have agreed to a six-hour daily no-fly window in the northern end of the territory during the ceasefire. Meanwhile, a G20 virtual summit was held on Wednesday, during which all leaders welcomed the news of a ceasefire and held further discussions for a sustainable ceasefire and peace agreement. The meeting was presided over by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who called on leaders to do everything in their power to ensure that the Israel-Hamas conflict does not spread further, calling the situation a matter of concern for all of us. Finland has said it will close all but one crossing point on its border with Russia in an effort to hold a flow of asylum seekers to the Nordic nation, as Estonian accused Moscow of mounting a hybrid attack operation on Europe's eastern border. Finland said it will close all crossing points on its border with Russia, except for the northernmost one, from midnight Friday. That's in a bid to stop a flow of asylum seekers, which Helsinki said was instigated by Russia as a retaliation for Finland's closer defense ties with the U.S. Helsinki angered Moscow when it joined the NATO military alliance in April following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Finland's foreign minister, Elena Valtinen. Russia is effectively instrumentalizing people, um, not only letting people through to the Finnish border with invalid documents or missing documents, which has not been the case before, but also we have evidence that Russia is eff effectively um, bringing those people to the border and uh, organizing transport as well. Since the beginning of the month, more than 600 people without valid travel documents to the European Union have come to Finland via Russia. That prompted Helsinki to shut several crossings and accuse Moscow of funneling migrants, a charge the Kremlin denies. This video shows several groups of people near the Russian-Finnish frontier, walking in direction of the border. Could not verify when the video was filmed. The EU's border agency Frontex said it plans to deploy more offices and equipment to Finland as soon as next week, in response to a request from Helsinki. 
All the crossings except the Chaya Yosepi checkpoint will be shut until December 23rd. Finns wanting to enter Russia will also be barred. The Finnish government said it will also seek to amend legislation that prevents it from closing the entire border. The Kremlin earlier said it had lodged a formal protest over the partial border closure, accusing Finland of being Russophobic. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Major U.S. election updates on the road to the White House next. Eight Republicans vying for president could be on the Florida primary ballot in March, including one last-minute surprise candidate. The Republican Party of Florida announced the primary ballot lineup immediately after the party's internal qualifying deadline had passed. They include North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy and former President Donald Trump. Senator Tim Scott, who abruptly ended his campaign this month, qualified for the Florida primary but is not expected to appear on the ballot, according to the Republican Party of Florida. One surprise candidate who filed to be on the Florida ballot was Ryan Binkley, a CEO and pastor who launched his long-shot bid for president earlier this year and has largely financed his campaign by himself. Federal campaign filings show that Blinkley had spent more than $7 million on the race by the end of September. Many GOP candidates wanting to appear on the ballot appeared at the Floridian Freedom Summit earlier this month, including Trump and DeSantis. North Korea stated that it would deploy stronger armed forces and new weapons on its borders with the South, a day after Seoul suspended part of a 2018 inter-Korean military accord in protest over Pyongyang's launch of a spy satellite. North Korea said on Thursday it would scrap a military deal with the South and deploy more troops along their shared border. That's after Seoul suspended part of a 2018 pact with the North a day earlier in protest over Pyongyang's launch of a spy satellite earlier this week. North Korea's defense ministry said in a statement, quote, From now on, our army will never be bound by the September 19th North-South military agreement. And, quote, We will withdraw the military steps taken to prevent military tension and conflict in all spheres, including ground, sea, and air, and deploy more powerful armed forces and new type military hardware in the region along the military demarcation line. The statement came hours after Pyongyang fired a ballistic missile toward the sea on Wednesday. South Korea said that launch appeared to have failed. Tuesday's satellite launch was North Korea's third attempt this year, after two failures. It came after North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un made a rare trip to Russia, during which Russian President Vladimir Putin vowed deeper cooperation, including helping Pyongyang build satellites. Seoul says it's likely Russia helped in technical aspects of the launch, which drew condemnation worldwide for flouting UN resolutions that bar Pyongyang from tech that could be used in ballistic missile programs. Seoul believes the satellite has entered orbit, but said it needs more time to work out if it was functional. In response to the launch, South Korean Prime Minister Hong duk su announced partially suspending the 919 Agreement, an inter-Korean military pact signed in 2018, until, quote, mutual trust is restored between the two Koreas. One of the concrete steps is immediately resuming military observation of the North's forces in border areas. The U.S. says Seoul's suspension of the deal was a, quote, prudent and restrained response, citing Pyongyang's, quote, failure to adhere to the agreement. The United Kingdom's finance minister, Jeremy Hunt, announced tax cuts alongside many other measures to help grow the country's stagnating economy in his autumn statement budget. Let's take a look. Britain will cut taxes for workers and give businesses more incentives to invest. That was the message from Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt as he unveiled a new budget on Wednesday. We have taken difficult decisions to put our economy back on track. We've supported families with rising bills, cut borrowing and halved inflation. Rather than a recession, the economy has grown. 
Rather than falling as predicted, real incomes have risen. Our plan for the British economy is working, but the work is not done. Hunt announced a bigger than expected cut in social security contributions, as well as big rises in welfare payments and the state pension. The government also said it would cut the rate of contributions to the national insurance social security system for employees by two percentage points. Hunt claimed measures in his plan would raise business investment by $25 billion a year within a decade or nearly 1% of GDP. But in the short term at least, Britain's economy moves slowly. Gross domestic product is expected to grow by 0.7% next year, much weaker than the expansion of 1.8% forecast by officials in March. Britain's economy has struggled with the highest inflation rate among its rich country peers, although the pace of price growth has slowed from more than 11% just over a year ago to 4.6% in October. Hunt and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will hope Wednesday's budget gives a boost to both the economy and their electoral chances, where polls show the ruling Conservatives trailing the opposition Labour Party ahead of an expected election next year. Now over in France. The nation's capital, Paris, is gearing up to combat the influx of large sports utility vehicles or SUVs in its core by raising parking fees for heavier cars. A strategic plan which involves a citizen support is in place for early next year. To deter the use of large sports utility vehicles or SUVs in the French capital, Paris officials are proposing raising parking fees for the heavier cars. A referendum will be held in response to concerns about safety and pollution, as Deputy Mayor David Balliard explains. First, it is to say to manufacturers, stop building this type of car because it is too expensive, too polluting and completely unsuitable. It is even absurd at a time when we need to move towards lighter vehicles. And it is to tell all those who continue to use their private cars because they are the richest, no. Bicycles and pedestrian-friendly policies have steadily reduced the number of cars in Paris over the past 10 years. But the average size of cars in the capital has increased. Paris City Council argues SUVs consume more fuel than a standard vehicle and because of their size, are more dangerous for pedestrians. They'll use scanners to determine the weight of parked vehicles. Local opinions on the idea are split. They encourage people to buy electric cars and then they start taxing them. It's a symbol of another era. At a time when there's a lot of traffic, it takes up too much space, for my taste. I think it's a symbol of crushing others, which I don't like. The Motorist Association believes the initiative is the latest move in an anti-car process Paris has embarked on for years. I'd say that today SUVs and cars in general are much heavier and bulkier than they used to be. It's for reasons of safety, comfort and even ecology, environmental reasons. A lot of modifications have been made. The manufacturers have made enormous efforts with these vehicles. It's the second referendum Paris has held on urban matters after banning rental scooters in September. The citizens' vote is set down for February. Welcome back. Trapped Indian workers are close to being rescued. For more on that story and more, let's take it on the world in a minute. Rescuers in India deal through debris to reach 41 men trapped in a tunnel in Himalayan region after removing a metal obstruction that slowed progress overnight. New Zealand's incoming Prime Minister Christopher Luxon stated that his national party had reached an agreement with ACT New Zealand and New Zealand First to form a government. Ending weeks of negotiation and political uncertainty with the country under a caretaker government. Anti-Islam populist Gert Wilders won a huge victory in Dutch elections, 
In a stunning lurch, the far-right filmation once came as a beacon of tolerance. Oscar-winning actor Jamie Foxx was accused of sexual assault in a lawsuit that alleged he groped a woman at a rooftop bar in August 2015. The Mexican army was deployed in the streets of Culiacan after the National Guard captured Nestor Cidro Perez Salas or El Nino, who is accused of heading security for the factions of the Sinaloa cartel. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you miss any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight we are leaving you in USA as Pikachu, Ronald McDonald and many other balloons got a pump up at the 97th annual Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in New York. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.